All right, we left off with Jesus on the cross, dying in our place, dying for our sins. We saw how Jesus continued to forgive and bless and save others, even as he hung on the cross. Uh, we looked at the seven sayings of Jesus um, while he was on the cross. Seven short sentences that demonstrate his love, his compassion, his grace and mercy. Um, he was fulfilling the whole purpose of why he came from heaven to earth 2,000 years ago. And, and we see this even demonstrated while he's hanging on the cross, bloodied and beaten, tortured. And yet we see him saying these seven things real quickly. We went in greater detail last time, but it's the first thing he said as he lifted him up on the cross was, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And then a short time later, one of the two thieves who was being crucified with Jesus, they were both mocking him and belittling him. And then one of the thieves had a change of heart. He humbled himself, said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Then he makes um, arrangements, even from the cross, he's making arrangements with his mother, Mary, and, and the Apostle John, and he looks at his mother and says, Behold your son, referring to John, and um, you know, to Mary, Behold your son. And it says, From that point on, John took her in as his own. And so, those were done before noon, and then we're told from noon till three, it was darkness over the whole land, and it was when God is pouring out his wrath and judgment upon Jesus for our sins, so he cries out in his fourth statement, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and again, that was at that time when he was absorbing the punishment we deserve for our sins. He was taking all of the wrath and judgment we deserve upon himself. And then it says Jesus, you know, says, I thirst. So they lift up a, a sponge with had sour wine on it just so he could, you know, basically catch his breath and be able to shout out, uh, the all-important words, it is finished, to tell us die, paid in full. In other words, Jesus has now accomplished his mission for why he came from heaven to earth to pay the price in full for our sins. Then the last thing Jesus said, these weren't, again, these were looking at all the different gospel uh, messages. Hey, Dale. Hi, Carol. Amazing. Good to see you here. Carol had a stroke two weeks ago. And so uh, I'm, I'm awesome. it's awesome that you're here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, anyway, uh, the last thing he said, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And, and as uh, the end of verse 50 here in Matthew 27 says, that's when Jesus yielded up his spirit. In other words, they didn't kill Jesus. Jesus willingly gave up his spirit. He willingly died for you and me. Uh, Jesus described this earlier in his ministry in John chapter 10. Look at these verses. Verse 17, it says, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. <clears throat> and so again, Jesus is not a victim. You know, he's not a victim here at all. But he was in control through this whole ordeal. And so now, having just yielded up his spirit, we pick up in chapter 27, look at verse 51. We got some amazing things to see here. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Uh, again, this all happens right at 3 p.m. That is when the Passover lamb, the official Passover lamb for the nation of Israel was slaughtered at 3 p.m. on Passover. That's exactly when Jesus dies and he yields up his spirit. And at that moment, we're told here, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This is incredible for a number of reasons. Uh, the, temple, the temple veil, as you know, originally there was a curtain between the Holy of Holies and the holy place in the tabernacle in the wilderness. Only the high priest could go through there and go into the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant and the uh, mercy seat was upon the Ark of the Covenant. And he would sprinkle blood on that 
once a year, he'd go do that on the Day of Atonement. But on this particular day, on this particular time, the temple that Herod had remodeled, it's the one Zerubbabel built after the captivity, they had a curtain in there that separated the Holy of Holies from the Holy Place. It was 80 feet high. It says, Josephus says it was a hand breadth in weight, width, about six inches wide. That's one thick curtain. I don't know how they would hang that thing up there, but it is torn from top to bottom. Amazing. Don't think of this as some little wedding veil that a woman has over her face and they can just like rip it. This thing was massive. This is a supernatural act of God when Jesus died and paid the price in full for all of our sins. This is God's way of saying, because I believe God reached down and just ripped this thing in two. It's his way of saying, all of you lost and helpless sinners, you now have access to me. You can now come to me through Jesus, because Paul says his veil speaks of Jesus, that we have access to the Father, into the Holy of Holies, through Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection. And since it was Passover, when this thing ripped, there was hundreds of priests that were working around the Temple Mount at this time. Josephus says they slaughtered about 250,000 lambs during Passover in Jerusalem any given year at this time because it was one lamb for 10 people and there's about 2.5 million people that would show up for the three feasts there in Jerusalem. So it was a, a massive, crazy time, but then you have this ripping sound. I don't know what that would sound like, just ripping a piece of paper. <laughs> But can you imagine an 80-foot curtain, six inches thick, ripping? I think many priests, they were shaken by this. They got saved because of this. Look at this verse in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. It says, Then the word of God spread. And this is shortly after Pentecost, and the church is beginning to grow. It says, And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many priests were obedient to the faith. From that moment on, God no longer recognized the Jewish sacrificial system that he established with Moses that was part of their culture for 1,500 years or so. He no longer recognized it because Jesus fulfilled all the sacrificial system. He destroyed you know, sin by becoming sin for us. He took upon himself the wrath and judgment we deserve for our sins. The blood of bulls, goats, sheep could never take away our sins. They were simply temporary covering for our sins. But Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice who is the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Again, he said he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And he fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law by becoming that final sacrifice for us. Hebrews chapter 10 Verses 5 through 7 says it like this, Therefore, when he, Jesus, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure, because it was just a routine for the Jews at this point. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God." And so what a remarkable thing that Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. The sacrificial system has been fulfilled once and for all. Every lamb that was slaughtered under the old covenant looked forward to Jesus, but Jesus, again, the final sacrificial lamb of God. So the Jews would continue to do this on the temple mount, in the temple, for the next 37 years or so. And then it was destroyed. The temple was wiped out by Titus in 70 AD. But all those sacrifices after Jesus, they were for nothing. Jesus fulfilled everything that the Lord required. The veil is torn in two from top to bottom. It's removed once and for all. We don't need any priest. We don't need any mediator to stand before God and us. We have Jesus. He is the mediator between man and God. We don't need a high priest. We don't need a pastor. We don't need anybody to get between us and the Lord. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, 
the man Christ Jesus. So we now have direct access into the throne room of God's grace. This is why we're told in Hebrews 4, 16, this amazing verse that we, uh, he says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That doesn't mean arrogantly. That's the wrong verse. It's 416. I must have given you the wrong one. So this is what 416 says. Let us come boldly, therefore, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Boldly, not arrogantly, but boldly means confidently. The throne room of grace, because the veil is torn, we can come into the presence of God 24-7, whenever we need to because He is open to receive anything, everything from us. He is our high priest. Well, look at verse 52. And yes, we are going to try to finish this book. We've got one verse down. So I hope you don't have any lunch plans. Verse 52, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. What in the world is going on here? I have no idea. <laughs> this is the only place you find this in any of the Gospels. You know, when I see Matthew in heaven, it's like, didn't the Holy Spirit? No, he didn't. But could you give us a little more info on what happened here? Because this is the only mention. It, notice it says, graves were opened. Uh, these graves are also known as sarcophaguses. Uh, these were tombs where they would place the ossuary. The ossuary was a bone box. That's how the Jews would do it. They would lay the body, in a, we'll talk about this in a moment with Jesus, but they lay the body, very thin you know, garments. They didn't wrap them up like a mummy. That was an Egyptian thing. Because there in Israel, the bodies would decompose very quickly. Within two years, there would be a skeleton left in that burial place. They would go in, they take the femur, the longest bone, and then they would make the bone box that would fit the femur, and then you'd fold up all the other boxes or bones in that box, called an ossuary. In fact, in 1990, they found a number of these, and one of them they found was, it says, the high priest Caiaphas. They found his ossuary there in Jerusalem. Pretty amazing. Be that as it may, scholars believe this resurrection of many saints refers to Old Testament saints. Notice it says, many bodies of the saints were raised, not all of them, just many of them. Whatever happened here, it must have just blown the minds of the people there in Jerusalem. All of a sudden, they see these people that were dead. Now they're walking around the city. We don't know what happened to them afterwards. Did they re-die? Did they go up into heaven? It doesn't tell us. So this is one of those things where, you know, we wait, wait till we get to heaven for more information. Look at this, verse 54. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. So you have not just as one centurion, but it says those who were with him, they are terrified. Like a lot of people, these soldiers had been mocking Jesus. These are the guys who've been you know, casting lots for his clothes, gambling for his clothes. They probably still have blood of Jesus on their hands and these other thieves because they're the ones that would drive the nails into the thieves and into Jesus' hands and feet. And all of a sudden, they hear Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he's talking about these Romans. He hears, you know, Jesus, forgive this thief who is about to die. Now there's this earthquake, and it says, They feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. Again, it doesn't tell us if they got saved, if they put their faith in Jesus alone for their salvation. But wouldn't that be awesome to get to heaven and see these guys there? What a testimony they would have. Verse 55, And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When you put all these gospel accounts together, um, like Matthew says here, there were many women who were gathered together at the cross. They're hearing all that Jesus is doing. They're seeing these things. They're, they're grieved. They're shocked by all that's going on. There's only one male disciple with them on the Temple Mount, and that's the Apostle John. All the others had fled. They were hiding. 
There were about four Marys at the cross, Mary, Jesus' mother, Mary, the uh, wife of Cleopas, Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus had cast out seven demons, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. These were brave women because they did not fear anyone. They're there. They're not going to turn their back on the Lord. They were not ashamed to be identified as followers of Jesus. Now, before we look at verse 57, it's between these two verses that the Apostle John gives us some more insights, some more details. We're told that this was the day of preparation. The next day was a high Sabbath. Uh, the Jews asked Pilate if they could take the bodies down off the cross because they didn't want these guys hanging around and ruining Passover for everybody. We don't want dead bodies hanging here or even guys because crucifixions could last for weeks. I mean, it was brutal. And so they want them put to death quickly, taken off the cross before, you know, the whole, you know, Feast of Unleavened Bread is going to take place. And so anyway, they go to Pilate and Pilate says, okay, you can take, the, take them off the cross. So we're told the Romans would take clubs and they broke the legs of the first two thieves. Why would they break their legs? Because as you're hanging on the cross, your knees are slightly bent, you got the nail through your feet, and there's a little peg sticking out of the cross, and they would be able to push on that to get, catch their breath. So they're hanging. The only way they could breathe was to push up. Once you broke their legs, they would qu quickly collapse and suffocate. And so th that's what we're told. This is what we read in John 19, verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And so the, the, the spear would have pierced the sack around the heart and out pours blood and water. And, and the bottom line is Jesus is as dead as a person could be. And then even this fulfills Old Testament scripture. John 19, 36 says, For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken, Psalm 34, verse 20. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. That's from Zechariah 12, verse 10. So now we pick up in verse 57. Now an evening had come. There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself also had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, so it shows you how influential Joseph of Arimathea was. Nobody could just walk up to Pontius Pilate and say, hey, can I have his body? I mean, he, history says he was the third richest man in Jerusalem at this time. He was very, very powerful, very, very influential. He goes to Pontius Pilate and asked for his body. So it says, when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Now, again, when you look at all the other gospel records, we're given some um, you know, wonderful details about Joseph of Arimathea. Again, he was a rich man, very wealthy. Um, Mark tells us that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Uh, he, we're told he was very prominent. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, we're told that he was a good and righteous man. Uh, he was one of the few religious leaders that opposed the crucifixion of Jesus. It's with boldness here he goes to Pontius Pilate. He asks for the body of Jesus so he can give him a proper burial. It's also in John's gospel that we're told another man helped him, and that would be Nicodemus. Remember Nick at night? He came to Jesus there in John chapter 3, and they get in this beautiful discussion about being born again. Jesus says, you must be born again. So, both of these guys, they're not ashamed of being identified with Jesus. Earlier they were because we're told that they were disciples of Jesus in secret. Well, there's no secret now. They're out in the open. They're bold in their determination to give Jesus a proper burial. When they would crucify someone in Jerusalem, they would take the bodies down and they would throw them in the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom, also known as the Valley of Gehenna. 
That's where the term Gehenna comes from, perpetual burning, because it was a dump outside just below in the Kidron Valley. They would drop the bodies in there. They would be burning all the trash and stuff there, and the birds and the animals would come and just devour these bodies. They're like, we're not letting this happen to Jesus. No, we're going to give him a proper burial here. And so here's these two very prominent Jewish religious leaders. They take it upon themselves to go to the cross. And can you imagine? I mean, they're having to you know, pound the nails back out of Jesus' hands and feet. And they're, they're going to take the crown of thorns off his head you know, that was beaten into his brow. I'm sure they're probably pulling out the thorns out of his scalp. And then they would do... The Jews would always do a, a ceremonial washing. And, you know, just with Jesus, you know, they would just wash him best they could, flip him over, wash him. I mean, just shredded. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, because they loved him so much. They would wrap his body in linen cloths. This was known as the takrahim. The takrahim was a 14 foot long piece of cloth, about four feet wide. If you've seen the Shroud of Turin, I'm not going to say that's official or not, but that is a very good example of what they would do. The takrahim was a 14-foot piece of cloth. They would lay the body on that with the head at the seven-foot mark. They'd fold it over. They would tie the feet. They would tie the knees. They would tie the hands. They would tie the jaw shut. They'd put a, usually a garment over the head, and they would give him a proper burial. Again, it's not heavy-duty material. They're not mummifying him. They would have spices just to keep him from smelling so bad because they would deteriorate very quickly there in these hot places in Jerusalem. Again, two years, that's the long as he'd leave a body in, in a tomb. They'd take up the bones and put them away in an ossuary. Well, Jesus only needed it for the weekend. You know, they didn't need to do a bone box and all that. And so they, they give him this proper burial and Joseph and Nicodemus. I mean, this is a huge thing because now they're unclean. They can't participate in Passover. But even more importantly, they will be kicked out of the Jewish fellowship. They'll no longer be members of the Sanhedrin. They would lose everything. History would say, say I think it was Joseph of Arimathea's daughter, would just be sweeping like barns, you know, looking for pieces of barley because they were, you know, so empty of everything. They lost their jobs. They lost their money. They would lose everything because of their identity with Christ. We're also told here, notice this tomb. They put his body in as a new tomb. It's Joseph's tomb here. It says it was hewn. That means it was chiseled out of solid rock. We're told that nobody had been laid in this tomb before. Again, the custom was the body would be placed in the tomb to deteriorate, but Jesus didn't need to be in there that long. Um, go ahead and put those pictures up. This is the garden tomb. We always go here. We usually end our trips in Israel here. And uh, this, the reason this is so significant, because just about 75 yards, if you went to the right around there, is um, Golgotha. And that's where they would crucify Jesus. And then they would take him here. They probably carried his body to this garden tomb. It fits the profile perfectly because it was a private tomb hewn out of rock. Uh, General Gordon uncovered this in the 1880s, and uh, it's very significant. They would uh, put the body in there. They'd roll a stone. Go ahead and put the next picture up. And there's th this trough. It's like a curb, but this trough's about this wide, and they would put a you know two-ton stone, and it would roll in front of it. And about where those flowers are on the closest to us there, those red flowers, there's like a stopper there carved out of the rock, and the tombstone would hit that because it's slanting downhill. It hit that and stopped, then they would put it in place, and you would be there. And then when time came to take the body out, they would roll it back over. It took a lot of people to do it. Again, these things are heavy. It would roll easy one way, the other way not so easy. So that's where I think it took place. Be that as it may, look at verse 62 back here in chapter 27. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, 
lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So when he says, you have a guard, make it as secure as you know how, they're, they're giving us the perfect scenario for why nobody could steal the body of Jesus. I mean, this is great because the word guard here is custodia, where we get the word custodian, but the custodia was an elite force in the Roman guard. These would consist of 16 Roman soldiers. These were like, you know, Navy SEAL kind of guys. These were the top of the class, you might say. And Pilate is telling these um, Jewish leaders, you have these elite soldiers. And he could send these elite soldiers anywhere he wanted to. And he says, I'm giving these guys to you. You have these. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. Again, about 16 soldiers. These guys were well-trained in all types of warfare. So the bottom line is there ain't no way any of these disciples are going to come and steal this body. If you got close to that tomb, these guys would you know, stab you, spear you. You were dead. So nobody's going to take the body. Well, they're not letting anybody take Jesus, so they think. Verse 1, chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, which, what day is that? Sunday? Yeah, first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Again, we're told in Mark's gospel they were bringing additional spices to anoint the body of Jesus. Again, just to keep the smell down so it wouldn't get too ripe down the road. That's their thinking. They're looking for a dead Jesus. They watched where Joseph of Arimathea laid the body of Jesus, and so they knew where that was, but they did not know about these guards, because if they would have known about these guards, they, they never would have come to this tomb, because they would have been put to death. Be that as it may, God knew all this, so he sent an angel ahead of them. Verse 2, and behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow, and the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So here's this elite group of soldiers who are scared to death. I mean, an angel descends. I mean, he's glistening. I mean, he just drops down. There's a great earthquake. The word great here is mega. It's a mega earthquake. It's not a little rumble. I mean, this was a big earthquake. It shakes the place. The tombstone is rolled away. And, you know, top it off, here's the angel just kind of sitting on top of it. And like, what are you guys going to do now? <laughs> You're not going to stop me. I mean, it's amazing. He's just kind of hanging out, sitting on top of the stone. Now, these soldiers are terrified for a couple of reasons. They're obviously stunned by seeing this angel shining bright, showing up, but they're also terrified because they have failed to keep the body of Jesus secure. And they know if we go to Pilate and tell him, if we go to our commanding officer and tell him, they would be put to death. And so we're going to see where they go. They go to the religious leaders. We know this is the case because when Peter, remember when Peter was arrested James was put to death. Peter's arrested in Acts chapter 12. And he's sitting there in prison. He's thinking, okay, I'm next. I'll die tomorrow. And while he's sleeping, an angel shows up, opens the prison doors. His chains fall off. And he's like, wake up, Peter. Peter's like, oh, it's a nice dream. Hi. And he goes, yeah, put on your sandals. Put on your cloak. We're going. And so he didn't even know what was going on. He goes out the prison. He's standing out there. And the angel disappears. And Peter realizes, oh, wow, this is true. Well, when the people find out, Peter's gone. King Herod, it says that he interviews the guards that were watching him and immediately puts them to death. These guys would have been put to death. So watch what they do. Verse, um, f or not what they do, but look at verse 5. These guards are shaking. Verse 5 says, But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, 
For he is risen, as he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. You seek Jesus who is crucified. He says, he's not here, for he is risen. Those simple words have changed time and eternity for all of us. He was crucified, but he's not here. He is risen. This is the gospel in a nutshell. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why he was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. His crucifixion would mean nothing to any of us unless he rose from the dead. Otherwise, he'd be just another dead religious leader. But he died for our sins. But our sins could not be forgiven unless he rose from the dead because now he alone can offer us the free gift of eternal life. This is why the gospel of Jesus is the most important biblical doctrine there is. I mean, our eternal salvation hinges on this truth. Look at these verses, Romans 1.16. The Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The gospel, he died for our sins. He rose from the dead. This is what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures." In fact, the gospel of Jesus Christ is so important. It's so simple, so straightforward, so true, so powerful. This is what Paul says to the Galatians. And this is why you can't change the gospel. Galatians 1.8 But even if we or an angel from heaven think of phony Moroni, phony baloney Moroni, the angel that appeared to Joseph Smith, gave him a new gospel, that applies here. Even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. There's only one genuine gospel message that leads to salvation. Jesus paid the price for our sins completely, totally. His blood alone can wash away all of our sins. So that means it is not by any good works that we could ever do to contribute to our salvation or to maintain our salvation. It's only by God's grace that we're saved. Faith alone in Christ alone equals salvation. And when we put our faith in Christ, what does He do? He imputes to us. He gives us His very own righteousness. This is why when God looks at you today, no matter what your condition presently right now, you could be stumbling and bumbling along, but if you are a true believer, you're in Christ, He sees you righteous. He sees you holy. He sees you forgiven. He sees you as one of His children. It's amazing. He's not saying, well, you got a few more years to work on yourself, and once you're good enough, then I'll adopt you into my family. No, He adopted you into His family when you were dead in your sin, when you were lost, when you were hopeless and helpless. He paid the price for you. If I had to do anything, if I had to keep any laws 100% of the time in order to earn or to keep my salvation, that would not be good news. That'd be the worst news of all. You know, the, the, James tells us in James chapter 2, verse 10, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. I mean, I've talked to people many times over the years, you know, do you, do you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Mm, yeah, God, yeah, I, I believe in God. I believe in the Ten Commandments. Oh, you think you're, you're going to save yourself by the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah, I try to keep them very hard. Well, James said, you stumble in one point. You ever had a guilty thought, lust in your heart? You ever taken a piece of candy when you are a kid? You're guilty of the law. You broke it. That's what the law is for, to show us that we are sinners who need a Savior. And Jesus is the only one who lived out the laws of God perfectly, 100%. So being in Christ and Christ in us, the law has been complete. It's been fulfilled in our lives. The Bible is very clear that no one can live up to the perfect standards of God's law. 
Jesus fulfilled every point, every jot and tittle of the law perfectly. Now, we're declared righteous in God's eyes, not by any works, but through Jesus Christ alone. He alone is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Well, look at verse 7. The angel tells Mary and Mary, <laughs> don't be afraid. You're looking for a dead man. He's not here. He's risen. And he says in verse 7, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. Have you ever had that experience? <laughs> you're, you're in fear, but great joy. That's mind-blowing. And ran to bring his disciples' word. So these women are running as fast as they can to tell the disciples, Jesus is alive. Look at verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Is Jesus God? Yes. He's not a created being. If he's a created being and you're worshipping him, that's idolatry. He's God the Son. That's why it's good to worship Jesus. They worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So as they're running, notice again it says, Jesus met them. That literally means they're running as fast as they can, whatever path they're on, and Jesus steps right in front of them. That's how he met them. He just steps out in front of them. It's like screeching to a halt. And he says, rejoice. And they bow down. They worship him. Notice they held him by the feet. They would have seen the nail holes in his feet. Remember when Jesus appears to the disciples later that evening and then the next week to Thomas. Here, put your finger right there in the hole. Put your hand in the hole in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. Then he tells them, don't be afraid. Verse 10, go and tell my brethren. Think about that. Go and tell my brethren. You mean those guys that denied you? You mean those guys that fled and ran away in fear? Go tell my brethren. That's how Jesus looks at you and me today. We are his brethren. That simply means brothers and sisters in Christ. None of us are perfect brethren, but we're Jesus' brethren. And he could say to you, go and tell that brother who's really struggling in an area. They're, they're letting themselves get beat up by the enemy, by the world, by their flesh. Go and tell him, that's my brother. Go and tell that sister. She's been stumbling. She's been struggling. She's you know, doing things she shouldn't be doing. Go and tell my, your, my sister, my brethren. It's okay. I love her. I'm not done with her yet. None of us are perfect brethren, but if you belong to Jesus, you are his brethren. And he who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. Matthew gives us the shortest account of what happened on this Resurrection Sunday. We don't have time to get into it, but I encourage you to read through Luke 24. He goes into a lot more detail about the two men on the road to Emmaus and that whole conversation. John chapter 20 and 21, he you know talks about you know, where he appears to the disciples that evening and then to Thomas a week later. And then he uh, restores Peter because Peter denied him. And Jesus says, do you love me, Peter? So I encourage you to read those chapters. Jesus will spend 40 days with the disciples after the resurrection, not just here in Galilee, but he'll spend more time with them. And it's, it's amazing when you look at the whole scenario. And then about a week before uh, Pentecost, he will ascend up into heaven. Well, look at verse 11 here. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard, and this is the only place we read this again in, in Matthew's gospel, not all of them, but some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they'd assembled with the elders and consulted together, 
they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So some of these uh, soldiers, they come to the religious leaders. Again, if they would have gone straight to Pilate or their commander, they would have been put to death. So they go to these guys. These religious leaders, I, I really think they believe Jesus did rise from the dead. I really think they believe an angel descended, earthquake, and all these things happened. I think they believe that. But they want to you know, cover it up. These religious leaders know the truth, but they don't want the truth to come out, so they fabricate this lie. Sounds like our government. It sounds like our media. You know, that's what Hitler said in Mein Kampf. He says, you just repeat the same lie over and over and over again. Pretty soon people think it's the truth. Notice it says here, they, you know, they, they said this, and verse 14 or 15 it says this is a commonly reported among the jews until this day matthew writes this like 30 years after the resurrection and that's still what they are believing because of this lie from these religious leaders they stole his body and people would buy it buy into it amazing Look at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Again, Jesus is worthy of worship. But some doubted. Now that doesn't mean they did not believe the resurrection because Jesus is standing right there in front of them. They believed that. But it's the same word used of Peter. Remember when Peter was in the boat and Jesus walks on water and then Peter says, hey, if it's you, Lord, call me out of the boat. And so he starts walking on water and then he starts looking at the waves and the wind and Peter's freaking out. He starts to sink. Jesus grabs him. They're in the boat. And then Jesus said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? That's the same word used here. Some doubted. Peter didn't doubt Jesus. He knew Jesus. He was just doubting that God could do this, that God could work through him, that God would actually want him walking on water. When Pentecost came, their doubts, their fears would be turned into great faith. And that's the only thing lacking between here and Pentecost. They're still in their own strength trying to figure these things out. Look at verse 18. Here we have the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one name, singular, in the name of these three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How can we be a part of the Great Commission? By understanding what Jesus says here first, all authority, all power has been given to Jesus. And in his power, he sends us out into this world. Jesus tells us the source of this power as he speaks these final words to his disciples just before he sends up into heaven. Look at these verses in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 46. We'll wrap it up here. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, this is right before he ascends, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Again, that's the gospel. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And then the last thing Jesus says before he ascends, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, written by Luke as well. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem 
and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So go, therefore. Go where? Well, go to your next door neighbor. Go to your coworker. Go in the Grand Junction. Go into Colorado. Go into the United States. Go into the uttermost parts of the world. And do what? Make disciples. How do we do that? Preach the gospel. That's how disciples are made. It's through the gospel. I can't make anybody a disciple. You share the gospel, they get saved, they become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then he says, you baptize them. Uh, again, not for salvation, but baptism is, I'm not ashamed to be identified with Jesus in his death, his burial, his resurrection. That's what it refers to. Then he says, and teach them all these things that I commanded you. Teach them what? The word of God. And so we teach the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. He gave some to be pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So as you get stronger in the Lord, then you go and make disciples, baptize. And that cycle continues as you teach the Word of God. Never forget, we can't do this on our own, but it's all based on Jesus Christ. The very last sentence there, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's with us. He empowers us. He says, you'll be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. When? Well, when you receive power. Power, what kind of power? Well, the word is dunamis, and it's from the Holy Spirit. I can't do anything on my own. I'm just a doofus, you know? On my own, I, I just stumble and bumble around. But as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the truth of God's Word, say, here I am, Lord, use me. And He will, because He's just looking for vessels that He can fill up with the Holy Spirit. The rivers of living water come out of our lives, and then people can see more of Jesus and less of you. Because they don't need you. They need Jesus. The world that's lost, they don't need me. They need Jesus. And so we're just vessels, little clay pots that we're saying, here I am, Lord. And that little clay pot can just pour out the word of God in the spirit, in the power of the spirit. And he does all the work. Amen. Amen. That's the last word there in, in Matthew's gospel. Amen.